So what do we knew, know about evidence-based treatment for selective mutism? So uh, there is, is virtually no research in this area adapting selective mutism treatment and what we know about good selective mutism treatment to children with autism. So the research I'm going to talk about is coming from the population of the general population and I'm going to illustrate how I've adapted what I know about ASD intervention to this, to this population. Um, and really even the intervention research in terms of selective mutism treatment has really um, only come online in the past you know, 10, 15 years. So what we know uh, there have been three treatment-specific reviews, and uh, we have, there's been two randomized control trials, which are what we think of as some of the strongest evidence uh, for showing that a treatment works or doesn't work. And um, the two RCTs were done in uh, children, each had about a sample size or about 20-ish children in, in each of the studies. And they compared behavioral intervention or psychosocial intervention um, that had a real strong behavioral component. They either randomized children to that intervention or to being on a wait list. And in both of those studies in children um, who, uh, who have sort of uh, typical development patterns, they uh, showed after this intervention that their speech um, greatly increased. So the, the key piece is that this treatment is strongly behavioral. Uh, and that's good news when we think about um, all of the experts in the room who have gotten really um, good at understanding behavioral principles in children with autism. Um, and this treatment is, is quite long. So the, the research shows that you need between 16 and 30 weeks of treatment to really um, produce gains. There's a lot of role play that's involved. Often these children are on, not always, but sometimes they're on medication, so some sort of SSRI, maybe fluoxetine, to bring down those levels of anxiety enough to really start to get some of the behavioral work going. A really key piece is, is, is having this not just happen in an office or a therapist's office, is, is to be around the hospital, be out in the community, um, and, and train people at school so that they're getting information uh, and treatment at all locations. And we just really, the goal we want to think about is breaking this habit of non-responding. Um, because you think in our day-to-day -day language, we interact so much in questions. And these kids are getting asked questions all the time and get reinforced for, for not answering because they're still getting what they want. So we really want to break that, that habit. So here I'm sort of uh, speaking to the choir a little bit in terms of really good behavioral principles. And, and that's really what's at the core of selective mutism treatment. So we want to make sure that um, when we're providing opportunities to children for speaking that they're really contingent. Um, so what I mean by that is if I was to offer do you want a ball, I want to make sure that the child uses some sort of language, whether it's a whisper in my ear, whether it's a part of the word, um, and give them the ball once they actually use the words. And we want to then really praise and keep that labeled praise. So it's a really nice brave talking. And in this case, the goal is to really increase what we call their brave talking. And so we want to label that for the child once they have um, used the words, um, great brave talking. I like the way you asked, asked for that ball. Um, and it, the treatment really consists of gradual shaping of behavior. So we want to gradually work up um, to having more increased brave talking in different environments. And, and as part of that, we're going to fade people in. So we're going to learn who are they already talking to, who are they talking to maybe very quietly, um, in what locations are they speaking to, and we're going to gradually fade people in from easiest to hardest over time. So the treatment, um, again, in the general population, a lot of this is based on the work by Dr. Stephen Kurtz. And there's two phases. The initial phase of the treatment is a warm-up phase. And in this uh, phase, we really want to set up the context of not um, asking questions. So we want to have the child warm up to the room, and we're going to kind of be like a sportscaster. So we're just going to describe what the child is doing. So, oh, I like the way that you're sitting that doll at the table. I love how, look at how big that tower is. Oh, I love that you put the yellow block on top of the tower. You're going to give lots of praise, and you really want to remove questions from this period because you don't want to set up the um, your new treatment phase as another time when they can um, get kind of uh, we want to break that pattern right away. And there's a lot of play, so the room is set up with a lot of toys and there's a lot of play at that, at that phase. And then we move into the, the talking phase, which is a verbal directed interaction. And this is the part of treatment where we very gradually start to um, shape the behavior, which is the goal of increased brave talking. 
Um, and so very early on, we would often just get the child, and let's say the mother is the person who they're, they're speaking to at this point, um, to, to be in the room, just the mother and the child, and I might be behind um, a one-way mirror, and the child might just answer a, a, a forced choice question, do you want the red car or the blue car, to the mother um, by whispering in her ear. And, and then we might work that they get that much louder in that room. And then maybe I'm standing outside of the door while the child is using their voice, whispering. And, and so you can see we kind of gradually really shape that behavior um, in this phase. And we want to give lots of time. So we'd ask questions. We'd wait for five seconds. And then if the child answers, then we're saying great, brave talking and praising that behavior. Um, so uh, we think a lot about types of questions in this treatment as well. So it is sort of nuanced in that we, uh, we want to avoid the yes or no questions because if I'm asking you a yes or no question, the tendency for all of us is to shake our head for yes or shake our head for no. And we're trying to get away from the nonverbals in this type of treatment. So let's talk about how um, we can adapt. Uh, selective mutism treatment for children with autism. And just a disclaimer, so I'm, I'm uh, not new to autism, but I'm new to selective mutism. So I was trying to take all of the things that I had known from the literature um, and from my clinical experience in autism and adapt it for, um, for this population. So what's really key, I think, is using all of the past assessment information that we have on the child with autism um, to make a realistic treatment goal. So if I'm uh, seeing a child, I'm going to be looking back at speech language uh, assessments in particular. So if a child is only ever um, able to say kind of phrase speech or three, three, phrase, uh, three word uh, phrases, I'm not going to have a goal that at the end of the treatment they're going to have back and forth conversations with their peers at school. So that piece is really drawing on where is their language at from past assessments, can they read, um, you know, what kind of sensory needs do they have, what kinds of things are they are really, really excited about, what, what do they like in terms of reinforcer assessment type things, and I'm going to link that very closely with the treatment goal to set everyone up for success. Visual schedules are important, of course, in this population. Um, really heavy on behavioral treatment. We know this in other types of evidence-based approaches, um, and particularly uh, for this type of treatment. Uh, and the treatment tends to be even, even longer than the 16 to 30 weeks um, for, for uh, individuals with ASD. And of course, using those external rewards is, is really key. So, um, you know, in, in the general population, speaking may eventually become really reinforcing naturally. Um, and, and it may still for individuals with ASD, but we really want to pair that with external rewards to kind of get the motivation going to use language and also structure the environment to, to support that. The other thing that I notice in my work with it so far is that the, the early phase of treatment, the child-directed interaction phase, I really made that much shorter and I adapted it. So uh, a lot of the, the independent play is not as reinforcing or enjoyable and it doesn't always necessarily allow those kids to feel comfortable and warm up, which is often the real goal of that phase. So I really made that phase much shorter. I put out toys that only I knew they, the child would really enjoy. Um, and, and so that, that piece was important. The other piece is that when I, I'm going to be talking about some brave speaking exposures or some things that they face their feared situation, and what I found is that pre-teaching of those of those skills was really key. So, uh, working with youth who don't have autism, you might just ask them as one of their steps in their brave speaking to go to the store and order a Timbit from Tim Hortons, let's say. Um, and with the children with autism, at some of them, um, I needed to do a lot of. Uh, pre-teaching. So what does it look like? How do you order something from the store? Um, can we make a, a script that we write out that has what, word for word what you're going to ask? Um, and then I think the other really uh, interesting piece is that I actually think the intense interest or the real special interest is a real strength in this treatment. Um, and so I really want to incorporate this because if it can, I can get a, a youth with ASD talking about their preferred interest and this treatment is going to go um, a, a lot easier.